Well, good afternoon. I see several of you are jumping on uh, at this time, and we want to thank you for joining us for Ranching 101. Uh, we're looking forward to having Clint Berry from Superior talk to us about how we can add value to our calf crop and our bottom line. Uh, but first, uh, before we get started, um, we want to say a great thank you to Lone Star Ag Credit, who is our sponsor of our Ranching 101 program. So at this time, uh, we'll play a short video clip from Ranching 101, from Lone Star Ag Credit. Well, we may have had some technical sound difficulties there, but we do want to thank uh, Lone Star Ag Credit so much for their sponsorship of our Ranching uh, 101 <laughs> program. Um, as a reminder, uh, we will have another Ranching 101 program in May. It'll be um, uh, talking about uh, scoping out sickness. It's going to be Tuesday, May 16th, and um, that program will be uh, hosted in partnership with a large animal veterinarian. As a change, it will be from noon to one o'clock, Tuesday, May 12th, um, talking about when's the right time to call your veterinarian, at what point can you uh, handle these uh, sicknesses on yourself, and how to handle common sicknesses that you may see, um, and at what point you call the veterinarian. So we're looking forward to hosting that Tuesday, May 16th at noon. At this time, um, as, as we previously mentioned, uh, looking forward to having Clint Berry. Uh, Clint, I know you are uh, somewhere in the Southeast working on uh, uh, video in camps for Superior at this point, but we sure appreciate you joining us, even if it's uh, a bit from the road and I'll turn it over to you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad to be here today and get a chance to join uh, I've been a TSCRA member for uh, 10 or 12 years. My, my grandpa was a TSCRA member and so had a long history with, uh, with, the, with the organization. Um, I do wanna say, I apologize. I was planning on being in front of, uh, in front of a computer sitting at a desk today and we had a, these things kind of happen. We had a phone call and had to go. And so I jumped in the truck, drove to Mississippi and videoed calves this morning. And now I'm headed back home to Texas, but um, glad to be here and, and you know, give a few thoughts and try to answer some questions. And it's always a great time to talk about marketing, especially in the world we're living in today. Um, if you would, could you advance my slide, please? <clears throat> Just tell you a little bit about Superior, if, if you're not familiar with us. Uh, um, we're based out of Hudson Oaks, uh, which is basically Weatherford. Um, we were based out of, out of the exchange building there in the stockyards for over 30 years. And, and about two or three years ago, we built a new building and moved out outside of town, had to kind of get away from the tourism down, down in, the, in the yards. And that was a changeover. But we, uh, we, we were started in 1987 and we're the world's largest livestock marketer. Everything we sell are in truckload lots. And uh, we, we operate on three platforms, uh, live auctions, which we have a sale every other Thursday. Uh, what we call the country page, which is an active platform that works 24 seven. And it, it, it's kind of like an eBay, you, you put an asking price down and you'll, you'll have, you know, buyers that can bid to you and, and kind of negotiate a little bit there. Um, and then we also do some private treaty transactions where, you know, you might have a buyer that is looking for a type of cattle. And if you can locate them and work a deal out, that works too. But uh, we, we sold a little over a million, eight head of cattle last year at Superior and growing every year. And, and uh, you know, we feel like we're operating off the world's largest uh, buyer base with over 7,500 active buyers and, and uh, it, you know, large multi-day auctions, uh, basically January and April, and then throughout our big summer run, which is mid-June through mid-September. Um, and on those days, we may sell cattle for two to five days straight. Um, you know, this Thursday, we, we should probably have about 30,000 head on the auction Thursday. And, and uh, we have one of them every other, every other Thursday. But uh, you can advance, please. 
Um, a little bit about me and my team. I've been with the company now for, uh, this is my 11th year. Um, I have a team of reps that helps me. Um, me and my crew, we sell cattle out of about 17 states from uh, a little bit out of every region. And uh, But I've got three guys in Montana, one in North Dakota, one in South Dakota, and then another in Texas that helps me. And you can advance. Thank you. Uh, we do sell cattle out of all, all parts of the country. Um, me and my team sell out of each of the regions, uh, giving us kind of a wide range of experience and quality and, uh, and seasonal production models and management. So, you know, we have guys that are, that are grazing at times of the year when others aren't and calving seasons that, that are accordingly, you know, seasonal based on, on, uh, you know, timeframes that fit the environment and the production models as well. But we've had some experience selling cattle from all different parts of the country and you can advance a little. And, and, and then uh, if you would hit it one more time, I think the, yeah, there you go. Um, and this is kind of the heart and soul that we start to get into talking about, because uh, I, I was asked to, to talk a little bit about value added programs and marketing prowess and, and the way that we can differentiate cattle. This is just a snapshot from our, um, our late March sale. And if you, if you can see on the slide in the box there, this is just an example of our market report from region three um, and, the, and the price variance that was the ranges there that on those, how those cattle were broke out. Region three would include Texas and the, and the Southern Plains area. Um, you know, if you understand that the variance in prices are due to a variety of factors, uh, genetics, management, value added programs, which is something we were going to talk about here and market timing, not only on when you're selling cattle, but more importantly, in, in our model, understanding that the delivery window makes a big impact too, because unlike a, a, a brick and mortar sale barn that, that sells cattle today and the transfer of ownership is today, at Superior, we will sell cattle for, for an immediate to a latter delivery point, which could be anywhere from you know, I, I've sold cattle in as quick as sell them on Thursday and ship them on Tuesday. And then we've, we've sold cattle that, you know, we might sell in June that don't ship until November. So that, that variance in those marketing prices are going to, are going to depend on a great deal of that, but it is also a high indicator of how much volatility there is in marketing. You know, it's not uncommon in our, in our market recaps to see 25 to to even $50 a hundred weight difference in the price of cattle for a variety of reasons. So just know when you're looking at those market recaps, unlike when you look at, you know, something out of the city or, some, or, or, or another barn or something, that those were cattle that were sold on that day and changed ownership on that day, you might be looking at cattle that sold on today and don't transfer ownership for six, eight, 10 weeks out. You just gotta be a little careful as you go through that and understanding those price variances because there is a big difference on that. You can advance, please. The next slide is, is just kind of a snapshot from that same sale. And I just wanted to point out some of the things we're gonna talk about here a little bit. Um, on our website, you will find a lot of information available. That's superiorlivestock.com. And I'll, I'll repeat that as we, as we go through, but you know, you can find those market reports, you can find the, the archived catalogs and pull those back up. There's search engines that you can put in different kinds of criteria and looking for, for types of cattle according to all different kinds of variables from sex to classification, to delivery windows, to value added programs, to wean status, to whatever you may want. Um, and most of that stuff is identified by those, what we call the logos or the icons that are at the, at the bottom end of that slide. Um, in this slide in particular, this was loaded with different, what we call value added logos, but, uh, you know, just a quick reference for, for buyers when they see them, they understand what those mean. Uh, and, you know, whether it be the type of slide that we're offering the cattle on, if it has a weight stop or not, um, what the vaccination protocols are and the management, which, which would include the weaning status of those cattle. Um, and then various va value added programs that we'll get into a little bit later on. Th this slide example also even talks to the point of, of where they've been purchasing their bulls from. You'll notice that there's a Superior Progressive Genetics logo there followed by an Express and a Gardner logos. So that, you know, that tells a buyer and it'll be written in the details of that contract as well. But 
that, that they're using predominantly express and gardener bulls on, on that set of cattle that, that they're bidding on on that day. You can advance a little bit. Thank you, ma'am. Um, before we get into, I, I know that anytime we talk about marketing and value added programs, most everybody's mind starts turning to programs such as naturals and different things like that. And I, I do wanna talk about them, but I wanna, I wanna be careful that we crawl before we walk because a ton of value in cattle starts at the conventional management level. And, and, and it's hard, to, no matter what the value added program is, it's hard to, to make up for mismanagement. So these are just some, some data points that were shared every, every other year. We get our data for two years in a row evaluated by Kansas State and Merck Animal Health that goes through and tries to differentiate what the, the factors are that are affecting sale price. And this slide has a few of them on there that, that would not traditionally be called value added programs, but it's important for folks to understand that the foundation is laid at, a, at, at the management level. Um, and so like, as, we, as, you, as you read through this slide, you'll see under our superior VAC protocols, the VAC 34 slash 34 plus was adding four to, uh, you know, about four and a half dollars, a hundred weight to the, the value of cattle. And that is compared to our VAC 24. Now, just, just to put this in simplicity, what we call a VAC 24 is a balling calf that's had one round of shots. And that round of shots is a five-way modified life with a, a seven or higher way clostridial, meaning a black leg, and then with at least one pastorilla. That pastorilla can be in a combo. We, we don't differentiate that. You can give the pastorilla as a standalone or in a combo either way. But our baseline cattle are a VAC 24. Our minimum, basically our minimum criteria is a VAC 24. Um, we just do not sell non-vaccinated calves. Uh, it makes up less than probably two tenths of a percent of the cattle that, that sell on our system. Um, our buyers expect vaccinations and they expect documented vaccinations like our programs are set up. So when you look at that VAC 34 status, that, that would have two rounds of the shots that I just mentioned. And so what, they're still balling calves, but that would have had a, a typically that's a round of, of shots at, on the cow when they're still a small calf. And then another round prior to shipping. And if, you know, a lot of people call that preconditioning and it's usually two to four weeks prior to shipping. So they've had two rounds of those shots. And then you move into the back 45, 45 pluses there, which are showing $8 and 60 cents, a hundred weight over that back 24. So what, what our data is telling you there, and, and understand the big difference on the VAC 45, it's the same re shot requirements that the 34s were, but they're 45 days weaned minimum. They, they can be more than that, but they have to be at least 45 days weaned. And that's, that weaning phase is a, big, is a big additive to that. But on our data on, on nearly 4 million head over the last two years, we showed an eight dollar and sixty cents per hundred weight addition over a calf that just received one round of shots and was balling off the cow, and then some other little ones. You know, BQA certified, certified, which has become a part of the requirement to qualify for some of the other value pro, um, value added programs. Uh, the difference between steers and heifers, you know, at nineteen dollars a hundred weight, and that that probably sounds really high to a lot of folks, but if if you're if you're feeding heifers as a feeding animal, you understand that, that there is a drastic difference. A, a lot of ranchers think that there's no difference between their steers and heifers genetically, and, and they're right, but a, a heifer is an inferior feeding animal as compared to a male counterpart of steer. And it's, it's mainly due for two factors. It's conversion, typically carcass quality is gonna be equal. That's, that's genetic and management based. Um, you know, I, I feed cattle too, and my heifers typically great as well, or, or just as, or even better at times than my steers, but they don't convert as well. So my cost to put every pound on is higher on a heifer. And the fact that in general, most heifers are going to weigh about a hundred pounds less harvest weight, kill weight as compared to steers. And that's, that's why when you're buying feeder cattle and, and not differentiating based on sex, that's a lot of reason why it's not uncommon to see heifers 10 to $20 back a steer price when we're not having pressure on a, on a retained ownership or a, a replacement heifer, you know, retained replacement heifer type of scenario. Um, here, 
the next one on there is, is pulled, you know, having no horns, 350, 100 weight. And, and we forget a lot about that. And we can get it lackadaisical about that. But the bruising on the carcasses in the feed yards is a, is a major component on, on deductions on carcass quality. And that this just goes to show how much better uh, or how much advantage there is into having cattle that have no horns, whether you've dehorned them properly and they have no, no horns or, or if they're pulled to begin with. I mean, the best dehorning practice in the world is, is using pulled bulls without a doubt, but um, that, that really adds up. You start taking 350, 100 over, you know, 600 pound calf and you're starting to get into some serious money there. Um, and I, I'm not picking on them, but, you know, we're, we're talking a little bit about genetics. This was just one that jumped out really big, but, you know, the, the use of different additives in genetics, we have it broke out by different ones, but, but a big one that was a, a negative discount was uh, $7.43 a hundredweight off of our heavy Brahmin cattle. So that would basically be, you know, something showing half American breed influence or more, um, and, and they, they all have their place by all means. I mean, the, there's, you know, you got to balance the maternal superiority and longevity, environmental adaptability that comes with, with crossbreeding using those kind of geti- genetics, but you also have to understand that comes at a cost. And that is typically in carcass quality and the access to premium product line. So um, there is a balance that you can walk there of utilizing those genetics that give you that advantage on a maternal and environmental adaptability standpoint without suffering the effects or the the high dose effects of of negative carcass qualities um because that is i mean at the end of the day we're going to eat these cattle and that that does that does play into it um that that 743 may pale in comparison in your environment if it's pretty harsh with the additives that they give but you know you have to you have to balance that as into what part of the country you're in and what the needs within your own operation are. Um, the Superior Progressive Genetics logo, we touched on it a little bit on that slide with all those icons on there, but that's that's just notifying the buyers that these cattle are predominantly sired by known genetics from from programs that that are uh, familiar with most people in the country, and uh, and and we'll we'll identify those individually based that broke out on those load on those lots as we're selling them. Um, split loads. Uh, we call them split loads. Other people call them mixed loads, uh, but it, it means steers and heifers mixed. So, you know, 450 to 650, 100 weight in discount. And I, I would tell you that's probably being conservative. I would say it's more closer to eight or $10, meaning it's eight or $10, you know, having a, a load of steers and heifers together on the same truck is probably going to discount your steer price eight or ten dollars a hundred weight off of being able to sell a whole load of steers um, and conversely a whole load of heifers compared to your heifer price off them and then a big one that that we we probably don't spend enough time on talking about but implants Um, in 20 years of data by third party looking at our programs we have no significant discounts on the use of implants in cattle now, when I say that, a lot of people are going to start to question me because they're going to they're going to they're going to assume that no implant and NHTC are the same. And, and so you've got to understand when I say NHTC, I'm talking about non hormone treated cattle. But forget the the hormone in there and understand that that's an export third party verified export program. That's a different deal. What we're talking about is selling cattle that have not been implanted versus selling cattle that have had one implant and there is no significant discount in premiums paid or prices received at sale time um, for the use of implants, assuming that you're not going into like the NHTC program. Um, and that's that's a critical component that I think a lot of ranchers are, are missing out on. They, they've, you know, there's a rumor or, a, or an idea out there that an implant is you know, reduces the sellability of your cattle and, and multiple implants will because that the that ability, that compensatory gain is lost to some of the feed yards. But one round of implants as compared to a calf that hadn't have any, there's no significant difference in price paid in our system. And we've got data to show that for, like I say, the last 20 years. So as you're, as we're getting ready to talk about the the true, what would be termed as value added programs. I just, I wanna stress that a lot of this starts 
that, you know, you got to crawl before you walk. And a lot of this starts at the foundational management. So building uniformity, building marketability and the types of genetics that you're using, matching them up with your environmental stresses, um, doing little things like knocking the horns off the cattle and, and vaccinating properly and, and understanding uh, timeliness in the marketplace, having, you know, what, which month those cattle are going to be di dying in at harvest time has a big effect on what the ability of the prices paid at feeder calf time is. Um, and utilizing implants if you're not going to be in some of the programs we're going to talk about. It's, that's, a, that's a big one that a lot of cattle producers miss is they don't implant their cattle and you know, an implant's a buck fifty to two dollars now, and you're giving up 20, 25 pounds according to the research data. That's that's a lot of money lost, especially when we're talking about selling two to three dollar calves. So, I mean, that's a that's a critical component in that that a lot of people overlook, and I think they leave a lot of money on the table simply by not doing that. But it, it's hard to get over. It's hard to add value to cattle if you don't get these things right first. Um, and that's that's a component that gets overlooked a lot. And when we're discussing about marketing cattle, if you would please advance the slide one. Then we get into to, to what the topic of today's conversation is is truly about, and that's that's going to be what we would classify as value added programs and talking about what kind of premiums we're seeing in the marketplace. Uh, most of these are either export access programs or they're internal domestic product uh, programs. And, and we'll talk about them as we go through, but it's a lot, the easiest way for me to describe how some of these programs work is it's like a stair-step process. So to climb up the ladder, you have to step on steps one and two as you move your way up. You can't, you can't go from the ground floor to step five without stepping on the other ladders. And, and these value-added programs work a lot like that. Um, it's an, and in my opinion, as we as we go through these, it becomes a strategy of either being all in or all out, and and everybody's operation is going to be different. And I, the the conversations I have with my customers vary depending on everybody's program. What what fits one outfit is not going to fit another, and and some some parts of the programs will fit some operations, and some will not. Um, some programs have a scale of, you know, a size, herd size or an operation size that's big enough to allow them flexibility to do some or all or both. Um, and others are, are going to have to be an all or none just, just due to the, the size of their operation. And so those are things that you've got to work your way through individually. And the math on that is different depending on what size your cow herd is and, and, and what your risk appetite is. But as we move through these, you'll see some of those logos and some of the, 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 the prices on here. And I, I want to stress the prices on the last slide were third party evaluated by Kansas State and Merck Animal Health. The prices on this slide are provided by IMI Global, which is the nation's largest uh, auditing company for these third party ver verified programs. And so in general, their data, and I'm not saying it's incorrect, but their, their data typically is a lot more aggressive than what we see on some, but they had a greater data source than what we had available to us. And so I use their numbers. But what I would stress is don't get so hung up on the exact number as much as it is the trend line and the way that these work and the way that these add value. But you, you kind of start at step one there, and that's the source and age programs. Um, we started source and age after the BSE cow in the early 2000s when we got locked out of the Japanese market. And the source was, of course, ranch of origin, and the age meant that the cattle at that time were under 20 months of age. The, the requirements now have gone to 30, and there's just not, outside of a handful of, of mismanaged or oddball type stuff, we just don't kill cattle in, in the U.S. that aren't under 30 months of age. So the age requirement portion of the source and age verification has really become a moot point. It's not really... Uh, you know, a critical piece, but the source to the ranch of origin is in a lot of these programs. It's critical. It's the critical first step. But you start off with the source and age programs and, and you know, IMI's data shows that they're, you know, returning nearly $3.50 a hundred on them. And then we move into the NHTC verified. And that's, that 
NHTC stands for non-hormone treated cattle. I referenced it earlier on when we were talking about implant and I wanna stress this once again. You can, when we're talking about implanting and not implanting, that's one decision, but, but the other decision in that is also whether or not you're enrolling in NHTC. So you can't implant cattle and enroll in NHTC. So they are non-hormone treated cattle, non-implanted cattle, but they have to be third-party verified carrying EID tags to be able to be eligible for export. NHTC verified is a program that was put together for us to be able to send product to the European Union. And that's the critical component. It is an export program. It, it does require that you don't use hormones, implants is what we call them here, but understand that, that there is a critical difference. Just because you don't implant does not make those cattle NHTC verified and eligible for export. They have to be third-party verified and enrolled in that program carrying EID tags for any of that product at harvest time to be shipped across the sea. That is also playing heavily into the Chinese market now because they, they do not allow hormones either. They haven't required NHTC, but they're pulling actual samples at the carcass plants at, at kill time. And so a lot of the packers are requiring NHTC if you're even going to put product into that Chinese export market. But I just want that to be a critical component. I have a lot of people that confuse the, the fact that they didn't implant their calves and they think that that can earn them an NHTC premium. And that is, a, that is exactly wrong. Uh, it, it's kind of like a light switch. You can have electricity run to the house and you can have all the wiring in the house and the light bulbs ready to go. But until you complete that third party audit and those cattle are actually NHTC verified carrying EID tags and you flip that light switch on, it's still dark in the room. So. You can't implant, but it takes more than that to get into that premium. And that's that's a confusing thing that a lot of people run into, especially when they first start into these programs. Then you move into the verified natural and that natural is a domestic only program. program. We don't ship natural, verified natural beef. We, we can, there's nothing keeping us from it, but in general, verified natural is not, uh, wasn't created for anything but a domestic supply. That's That's a, a service or, a, or a, a classification that we use here to sell product domestically. And that means no hormones, so no implants, no antibiotics of any kind, and no ionophores. And the ionophores are what get a lot of them. And that's, you know, Bovatec, Rumensin, different additives in our, in our lick tubs and our mineral and our feed rations. And that's the one that, that sometimes gets guys into trouble because, you know, maybe they got lucky and didn't treat but one or two calves they don't implant anyway, and they say they're natural, but they're forgetting about their feed additives, especially if they're buying bag feed or something from the co-op. And sometimes you gotta be careful on your product labels, but verified natural is a never ever type scenario where in most cases, those cattle can never have had those in their lifetime. And that's a restrictive program. Um, that is third party audited as well. And, and like I said, that is a domestic program, not an export one. So. Nine times out of 10, the cattle that we're handling, if they're verified natural, they're also NHTC because of course they couldn't have had an implant. And if you're gonna go ahead and go through the verification, you might as well get the NHTC portion of it done too, because it's all one audit. Um, so you'll see those join together a lot of times at the hip, but you can have NHTC cattle that are not natural because they they may have had an antibiotic or maybe they got an ionophore in their feed ration, but but they weren't implanted and so they're still NHTC verified. That's, that can be a little confusing from time to time. Then you move into two of the more social type programs, um, beef care and GAP. Um, let me start with, with GAP first. Uh, GAP is, stands for Global Animal Partnership. And GAP was created by a retailer, Whole Foods. And so all GAP product is targeted at the whole food supply chain, which now has, has been purchased by Amazon. But it, it's the food in the whole food stores, the beef in the whole food stores to be able to market beef through their stores, they have to be in GAP as well as other commodity products as well. To be in GAP, you have to be, they, they have to be natural cattle. 
they have to be raised under those standards. They don't have to be, this is where it gets confusing. They don't have to be verified natural. They will do producer affidavit, but you have to have a gap audit, which verifies it. Um, most of the time in our system to keep this simple, if, if they're gapped, they're also verified natural. And if they're verified natural, they're also NHT seed. And if they're NHT seed, they're also source and aged. You have to walk up that step ladder to get there. Um, then two years ago, IMI Global launched Beef Care. And this program I'm sorry, I fell off. At, I lost signal there. Can you still hear me? We can hear you now. Okay, okay. I apologize. I'll pick back up where we were at. I'm sorry, I uh, I lost signal there. I had to kick up my hotspot. Oh no, um, you, no, you're good. <laughs> um, on the beef care, we uh, that that was a program started to address the the conversations about sustainability. And, and it's a domestic targeted program, but the difference between it and GAP that has been, in my opinion, a very refreshing difference is that it was created by beef producers to tell our story on how we're raising cattle versus a retailer telling us as beef producers how they wanted us to raise our cattle. Not, not saying that any one of the practices involved in it was wrong, but just having the flexibility to be able to, to approach it from a science base, because some of the problems in the GAP program, there are requirements to that program that are non-science based, just emotional salesmanship. And, and that's fine. I'm a pure capitalist. And I, you know, if, if we want to raise cattle that way and, and we can get paid for it, I'm, I'm happy with that. that. That's an okay thing. But if we implemented some of the strategies in there, it would be a negative effect on production and that's I don't believe that's a good thing beef care helps address some of those because it gives producers the flexibility unlike gap which requires you to be natural and all the other things beef care allows you to be all of the above 
you can have beef care cattle that are natural. You can have beef care cattle that are gapped. You can have beef care cattle that are NHTC only. You can have beef care cattle that are all the above and you can have beef care cattle that are none of the above. Um, I've got some customers selling beef care cattle that are conventional fed cattle. You know, they could have been, there, there could be calves on the load that, that maybe had to be doctored at a, at a young point in age or maybe had foot rot at some point or a, maybe a pink eye um, or they've had Bovatec in their, in their uh, feed rations and, and been implanted and they're still beef care because they're still following the protocols of what that program are, which speaks to, to social, environmental, and, and, and humane handling issues. Um, but it is an opportunity as beef producers to differentiate us um, in the marketplace. And I, I really applaud that effort because I believe that, that is a, this is the first time in 25 years of marketing experience that I've seen a program that wasn't requirement of non-scientific based programs or, or production models. And that, that to me was a refreshing change because most of the time when you start talking about value added programs, they were taking away a science-based technology. Beef care did not do that. And I'm, I'm excited to see how that program grows. Like I said, it's pretty new and fresh, only two or three years of age on that one. Um, I, I guess part of what I would stress as we're sitting here talking about these, part of what I would stress when you're thinking about marketing strategies, I look at the value added programs that we just went over uh, and, and the theory on that a lot like being a railroad track. You can walk on the left side and you can walk on the right side and you're gonna be fine. But if you walk down the middle of the road, if you walk down the middle of the railroad track, sooner or later, you're gonna get run over. Um, and I, I see these programs, the way this marketing channel has went and these production models have went, that for the most part, and like I said, they, each operation's got to evaluate these differently, but if you're going to go the natural route and you're going to take away some of the scientific technologies that we use that add production efficiencies, pounds and conversion and those kind of things, then you've got to enroll and and at least have the opportunity to capture some of these premiums for those third party evaluated programs or take the approach and go the other route and 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 raise in essence what we would consider to be conventional cattle and and take that route and take all of the benefit from the use of implants and antibiotics if you need them and ionophores for feed efficiency and capture that in, in expressed production efficiency to where you're getting paid for more pounds. The, the struggle that I have with, with producers um, that don't know which direction to go is sometimes they, they spend all their time in the middle and they're missing out on both ends. They've either lost out on added pounds or they've lost out on the opportunity for premiums. And, and that's the only wrong decision in it is, is in my opinion, um, look at your production model, what works for you, what are some minor changes that you might have to tweak, and are you willing to do that, what's your appetite for risk management um, as to how aggressive you want to be on stuff, because that, that can determine whether or not you're going to take the free pound or the easy pounds and implant or go the other route, but don't not make a decision, don't, don't, don't be doing the, the value added you know, removal of the scientific technology production model and then not step into the audited side where you can actually market those cattle and try to capture that, you know, do one or the other because walking down the middle is, is kind of where you lose on both ends. Advance the slide, please. And just, uh, just, just kind of closing thoughts here a little bit, but, uh, you can find a lot of the information on these programs some, and, and be able to access some of our online catalogs and, and see those formats and sell results. Um, you can get a lot of information off there. And we've got a lot of, uh, of uh, partnering companies that work with us that, that have links and on, on their, uh, through our website where you can learn more information. But that's superiorlivestock.com superiorlivestock.com is an easy way to find that information and the biggest probably the biggest take-home message that I'd like to give everyone um, is 
is when you're when you're working through these and trying to figure out what works for you just don't get caught up in the coffee shop talk um everybody wants to go to the coffee shop and brag about what the price per pound was on the calves they sold but sometimes they miss the profit per head you know it's easy to brag about 250 calves it's a lot harder to know your expenses and and know what you know how to increase that efficiency to actually put more dollars in your pocket just i tell my customers all the time don't let the tail wag the dog in general guys want to talk to me about value-added programs but i want to talk about management first and then see how your management fits the value-added programs and then evaluate what changes would have to be made if you wanted to be included in some of those programs and a lot of times it doesn't take much at all you know it's it's very low cost to move into them because your your production model is already there in other operations you know it, it, it's an incredible cost because they've got to take away the benefits of some of those science-based technologies that improve efficiency so just i always say build your management to fit your production model and your goals and your environment and then we will build a marketing plan around that. Don't try to create a marketing plan and build your management around it because that that's where it can get really cost uh, ineffective. But that's kind of my closing thoughts. I would love to answer some questions. I, I threw a lot at you and I, and I hope some of the terminology I explained well enough, but I'd be glad to help any way I could or answer questions if anybody had any. Yeah, thanks for your time, Clint. Um, if you do have questions, uh, first, go ahead and put those in the Q&A box or the chat box below, and we'll go ahead and ask those. At this time, we've got a few questions that are coming in, and so I'll start to hit some questions at you, Clint, and if you do okay. have questions, um, please drop those in the Q&A or chat box below. Um, and just a friendly reminder, the slides and recording link will be available. Um, if you registered for the webinar 24 hours from now, you'll get a link um, to the recording of this. So um, you'll see this very soon. <clears throat> okay, Clint, uh, first question for you. Are value added programs cumulative? Can you source and age with non hormone treated cattle with an estimated premium of eleven ninety five per hundred weight? Eleven ninety five? No, no way. No, nobody's going to give you twelve dollars a hundred weight for a source and age calf. Is that? Did I understand that question correctly? That's the question, but I think maybe you okay. could speak just, um, you know, to our value added programs cumulative. Will you add okay. source and then age and then non hormone treated on top of that? Yes. Yes, absolutely. You can you can work your way up through that. They are cumulative, like like the step ladder scenario. Um, the further up the, the those steps you go, the further uh, the, the the higher end of the third party verified programs, the greater access to more buyers. And I think that's probably the critical part. So so take your seller hat off for a second and think about being a buyer. The, the beauty of buying a calf that has multi layered third party. Um, third-party claims is that it gives you flexibility at marketing time because in our in our minds we think when we sell a, a gap calf or a natural calf that 100 percent of that product is going to go into that one product line but the reality is is that the the program buyers market those cattle and and have con contracts slots available for kill into different types of those uh, into different ones of those programs and you know, they may have bought natural calves at, and, and maybe the ones that had to get doctored in, during the feeding phase have fallen out of the natural, but now maybe they're in the NHTC phase. So, or, or even more complicated, maybe the middle meats are going to go into Gap and go into the Whole Food store in Denver, but, and the cheeks and the tongues are going to get exported to NHTC to Asia and the grind is going into Meyer Natural Angus. Um, so it, it, they vary like that, and that's how that cumulative phase works. But you've got to the further up you go, the more restrictive it gets, but the more lucrative typically it is. And I, I will stress this, while it's, it's pretty solid, uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty solid opportunity, it is an opportunity at a premium, not a guarantee. Just because you do these things, 
does not guarantee you that you're going to access the premiums that I spoke about. Those were the averages from 2 million head of cattle that, that, that were looked at in our system. Um, you know, and other systems are going to have different, different data than what I just shared. I mean, we, we sell more program cattle than everybody else combined. And so we are the go-to place for that. But I'm just telling you, it, it, you know, how you offer, how you market those cattle are different too, but, but just be careful to understand that that is an opportunity at a premium, not a guarantee. If you want a guarantee, you probably better implant your calves because you're, you know, decades worth of, of data shows that, you know, we're going to get a bump in, in, in pounds based on an implant value added programs like these third party ones, while it's a pretty good, pretty good chance you're going to receive it, that it is an opportunity, not, not a guarantee. Yeah, that's a great point, Clint. Um, next question, and this is a great question, and I think something that a lot of small producers struggle with is putting together load lots. Um, if yep. you've only got five or ten head, where does that responsibility lie? Do you feel like that's on a producer? Is that on a buyer? Uh, is that on a sale barn? Who 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 bears the responsibility of putting together a load lot? Well, that I mean, at the end of the day. Like, like any other business we have, the, the cost is going to fall uh, downstream. I mean, the freight prices we pay, that has to come off the price of the cattle, be passed on to the, to the, to the sellers. Um, and, and, you know, and we do the same thing on the other end on, on passing on all of, all of the money in the cattle industry comes from the consumer. So it has to work its way from the consumer back down, but those costs are working downward there. Um, it, it's the seller is going to going to bite the brunt of that. The seller of the cattle, the producer, the rancher, the farmer, whatever you want to you know, classify as that, um, because the person buying your cattle has got an increased operating cost. Um, you know, in general, we want it. The reason on Superior that we sell in truckload lots is because that's that's the first added value premium that we could capture right there is being able to sell them that way. Small producers are, are have got a different mathematical equation when we're talking about these things. It, you know, if, if you're selling 5, 10, 20, 25, even 50 head, it's going to be a lot harder for you to capture the kind of premiums that I just talked about because of the marketing channel that you're marketing in, unless you've got a unique scenario, unless you're selling You've got some kind of contractual agreement with a with a feeder who is going to be doing these program calves and he's buying cattle from lots of people just like you. Um, if you're if you're thinking that, I, I mean, I'd just be bold about this. And I'm our cell barns are a critical part of our beef industry. And by all means, I mean, we, we are a cell barn by nature from background. Most of our owners in Superior, most of our reps uh, are our cell barn owners as well. So I'm, I'm not being critical of a part of our segment that's, that's, that's with us in this, but the beauty of the cell barn is you can sell those small groups of cattle and merchandise them basically any day of the week. The, the app or the, the bad part about it is what you have to give up there is you have to go through the order buyer to be able to, there's nothing against the order buyer. He's there doing a job, but he's, he's putting together the cattle in those smaller groups and the low, load lot sizes to handle for the next uh the next buyer the actual buyer which is the feed yard operator or the stalker backgrounder and so they you know they don't have time to go and try to put those little groups of cattle together every day of the week they're home running their business too just like a lot of us are and that's that cost has got to be passed down to the guy that's got smaller amount of calves and that's why you see our cattle on in load lots outsell those and that's a tough scenario to walk through if, especially in these value added programs, because you got to understand, even if you join up with your neighbors or your family or something to sell, all of you've got to be on the same page and your audit costs are, are, are exponentially higher because, you know, there's flat fees and per head fees. Well, you can imagine if, if I'm dividing a flat fee over a hundred calves, that's a lot different price look than if I'm dividing that same flat fee over 10 calves. And so, if you want, if you want my personal opinion, this is not Spear Livestock. This is Clint Berry talking. But you know, if if you can't market in load lots, these value added programs are not going to be for you in general, unless you have a special relationship to where you can access. You know, you're selling like maybe through a market that has a 
a day where they're selling a lot of these calves together and you can join in on that. And that, that's a great marketing strategy or you are partnering with somebody or you have a direct sale into a yard that can access these programs. But if, if you're going to haul your calves to the sale barn, and they're selling 1500 head this week and you're taking 27 gap calves down there. If you're the only 27 gap calves down there. There's nobody going to pay you a premium for any of them gap calves. I don't care how good they are. They can't, they can't put a load together to do that. So those are things that, that that math is different. And that's, I alluded to that a little bit in my, in my conversation, your herd size, you know, everything's fair, but that doesn't mean it's equal. You know, it's guys with 300 calves to sell have more options than guys with 30 calves to sell. And that's, that's part of the strategy you've got to work through and how you want to attack that and combat that and what your risk is there. So you're going to have the smaller your herd size, the more creative you're going to have to get. That's, that's the kicker to it. And I, I know that's not, that's not probably painting roses, but that's, that's just the reality of the market. Well, and I think this next question really feeds into that is, is a part of that as well. Um, <clears throat> and I'll, I want to add on to what you said, Clint, you know, does the verified natural or beef care program only show up through superior sales programs, or do you see that premium in the sale barn format? And I think we know the answer to that, Clint, and I'll certainly let you speak on that. But to your point, you know, these gap calves going to the sale barn, no, um, if there's no other gap calves, they're the only 27 gap calves there, there's yeah. not going to be an ROI for that. But there is an ROI for doing other basic things that will increase the value of your calves, castration, vaccination, implantation, these basic level things are still going to increase the value of your calves at the sale barn. That's right. And that that's that's why I wanted to stress before we ever started talking about the third party verified, setting the foundation for adding value. If, if, if you want, you'll add more money to your calf crop by having better genetics, more uniformity, more consistency, uh, you know, better overall herd health management making them pulled, you know, taking out the outliers, all of the odd stuff and, and marketing them in a, in a channel that's not happenstance, a planned marketing plan uh, program where you're, you know, you're selling in a weaned pro protocol at, at, at your cell barns are going to have special programs where cattle have to have certain vaccinations to qualify and they have to be so many days weaned. Target those kind of events so that the order buyer sitting there can put together load lots of those cattle and, a, and afford to be able to pay you a premium for those because they can mix them with the others. And that's, that's the critical component because if, if you've got mismanagement on the beginning, no value added program is going to make up for that. And that's, those are all things, whether you've got five head or 5,000 head to sell, those are things that always add value. Um, you know, weaning your calves as long as you can put weight on them while you're weaning uh, added protocols for herd health especially I cannot stress this enough if your vaccination program doesn't include modified lives then you need to have a serious conversation with your vet because that using killed viruses and balling calves that are going to leave the ranch and go to the feed yard is asking for a wreck if your vaccination program doesn't include pastorella you need to have a serious conversation with your vet because the number two killer in the feed yard is pastorilla predominantly because a lot of calves come out of programs that have never had one. And when they get to the sale barn or the feed yard, they get exposed to it and they're no, they're novice by nature and it, it affects them that way. And then they, a lot of times they suffer on that. So those are things, those are little things that you can do that doesn't require a lot of money or a lot of extra effort. And that can drastically change the value on those calves. Well, talking about color too, this or talking about sale barns as well. Another question that we've got: Let's talk about color at the sale barn. Um, whether you're running them through a sale barn, you know, there's going to be some differences in just the sheer size and uniformity if they're going to superior. But if you've got six calves, you're taken to a sale barn. What are you looking for? This this um, this question says. I've got Angus Herford Cross, so he's got some black baldies. He's taking them to the sale barn. Is that the best thing? I mean, are we looking for a solid color, a baldy color? What's your opinion, Clint? Ooh, I'm going to make some guys mad. <laughs> um, so in, in general, and, and part of that is going to be dependent on your marketing avenue. You, you, you laid that up there really nice. But um, 
like in our video and truckload lots, we sell, and, and I'm going to transpose, let, let's use red hided because your, your questionnaire asked about baldies. You're fine. You know, a black baldy going with black cattle in general, you know, they're going to, they're going to trade right there, sell together, be put together on a load. Um, you know, we, we sell red hided cattle, which may be, there may be a little wide on some faces or something, but they're not, they're not a Hereford calf. You know, they're not a, a feather necked, line backed, anything like that. Um, same way with the blacks, those are the most prevalent, you know, black makes up 80% of the market. And yeah, if, especially if you're a smaller producer thinking about how to get my small number of calves in, included into the load lot so that I can maximize as much value out of them as I can, rather than being the outcast of the load lot, then I want to, I want to be similar. And, and that may be black in most cases that may be black, but it, it is predominantly solid. If, if you have, if you're running two or three bulls and each one of them is a different breed makeup, you probably really ought to think about your genetic selection. Now, I'm not going to tell you which way you ought to go. I have my own personal opinions on that. But what I would tell you is you need to build some uniformity in those calves. And you probably at least ought to have all the bulls of the same breed makeup so that at least half of the genetic input into your calf crop is similar. You know, it, it's not a shotgun approach. You know, I, I've, I've had customers that even on a large scale scenario, you know, turning out 15, 16 bulls or something, and they may be three or four breed makeups. And the first thing we're going to do is step in and narrow that down right, so that we can build uniformity in those cattle. And that's, that's a critical component. I've, I've got my personal opinions on what is an additive and what is not. But, you know, if you look around and think about how you're marketing and how your cattle can fit in on that, especially if you're smaller sized, you've got to understand the order buying system, which is the greatest blessing we have in the sale barn and the biggest curse we have. But it, they are the ones that have to put the orders together to actually go to the buyer. The order buyer is not the buyer. He's just the middleman putting it together, doing the legwork for him. But he, he can only buy the cattle that are in front of him. And if you've got the only wean cattle and everybody else's calves are balling, he's not going to pay you much of a premium. If you've got off colored cattle and he can't put them on a load with anything else, you're not going to get much of a premium. I don't care how good they are. So those are little critical things we can think about on how to build that, um, that, that, that are unbiased opinions. You know, I've got my personal breed makeup opinions. Yes, but that's, we won't get into that. We'll, We'll save that for a time that I can't get yelled at when it's not being recorded. Right. An unbiased platform here, I think. And I think, too, if you look at the numbers, I think just going, you know, before you take your calves in, go a week or two before, look what's yeah. selling, you know, and, and or when you sell your calves, you know, at that point, you're about to sell your calves, you've got what you've got. But look year to year what's selling when your calves run through that sale barn, look and see how they stack up to others and then ask yourself, my calves are all red and these calves are selling for 10 cents higher. You know, maybe there needs to be some reevaluation or vice versa. Maybe you live in a part of the country where there's a lot of ear or there's yeah. a lot of red, you know, right. and you need to match what's the majority coming in your sale barn. There's nothing wrong with that. I think it's just being aware of what your surroundings are. That, that's right. The, the, the correct answer for that for one person is different than for another so you have to evaluate on your own and and there's two pieces in there you brought up i want to i want to i would like to stress number one have a relationship with your vet especially if you're selling in the sale barn having documented vaccine protocols have it written down to where you hand it to the guy when you drop the calves off you hand it to the man in the ring that's going to be announcing it or you hand it you know, have that sheet go with your cattle when the buyer checks out, he's got that sheet there, you know, have have something that shows the vaccines you've been given. So at least they have some confidence and know you have a program there. That's even more critical. You know, in our system, you've got time to evaluate. You know, all of my contracts have exactly when and what what uh, vaccines and, and dewormers were given. Um, in the sale barn, we lose that opportunity at times. And I think that's critical. I, I know as an order buyer, that would be critical for me. Um, the other part is stay in communications with your marketing agent. You know, don't don't just show up sales on Thursday. Don't just show up Thursday morning and drop your calves off and go get a cheeseburger and expect the world to be gravy. If you the guy didn't even know your calves were coming, 
So, you know, stay in touch with him ahead of time and ask him, when do you think would be a good time to sell my calves? Here's, you know, here's kind of, I've got them weaned on this date or I'm planning on pulling them off the cow here, or, you know, is this week or two weeks from now, what, what would be good and give him some time to advertise them and, and have some prep work there too. That, that goes a long way of just planning that out, but your vet and your marketing agent are, are big additives to your success program. And they want to help you do that because you're paying them for their expertise. So use it. Yeah. I mean, if you, yeah, that's a great point. If you drop a sheet off, those auctioneers are going to want to use that because at the end of yep. the day, if your calves bring more, that's more for their, their sale board. And so if you drop a sheet off that says my calves are been banded, they've been weaned for 30 days, they've been vaccinated, they will announce that. And I think that's a, a, a misnomer that auctioneers just run cattle through. That's not true. They care about what your cattle bring and you need right. to take advantage of it. Um, we've got a few more questions to get through, okay. Clint. Uh, take your and time. this one I think goes back to the cow calf level and is a, such a great question. What's the value to a calving uh, season versus year round? And I think um, just a great question, you know, a 60 day, 30, 60, 90 yep. day calving period versus a year round uh, calving season. Okay. And, and I would uh, straight up first easy answer is labor. I mean, labor is probably, and that is the part that as producers, we are the worst in the world about figuring labor into our cost of production. There isn't another business in this country that doesn't equate labor to cost of production, but farmers and ranchers do this all the time. You know, they, they assume it doesn't cost them anything to drive out and check their cows or pull a heifer's calf or, you know, feed cattle or anything else. It's just their time. And, and we forget that added cost of labor. Now, you said 30, 60, 90 days. I would love to see a 30-day cabin season. That would be amazing. Even, even the best producers I know have to go about 45 or 50 days. Um, but for me, uh, the number one thing I can tell you is we go back to talking about uniformity and having a pro. I will tell you that when we're talking about these value-added programs, you cannot cab all year long that you will be restricted from a majority of these programs if you don't have a defined calving season. Now that that defined calving season might be four months, but it's it, it, it can't be the bulls are in all year long and never come out. Um, the other side of it though, like for me, that's critical is, is the calving window and the ability to control what I'm breeding and increase the uniformity in my calves. Because how can, unless you've got, you know, several hundred cows how are you ever going to put together a load of calves that are weight wise or relatively even you know and that's that's where it gets troublesome i mean most of my producers calving probably 70 days or less you know they might have a three-month calving season uh, or I, I mean they might have a three-month breeding season and they they calve 70 75 days or something and then they're done um, and I know transitioning into that can be difficult. And a lot of guys will do a spring and a fall herd. And sometimes that's, you can spread your bull cost out and do things like that, you spread your cash flow out. But, you know, it's, it's really hard to talk about adding value, just simple implementing herd health vaccination protocols. When calves need to be at least a certain age old or, or need to have things done to them, like castration and deworming or dehorning for some of these programs you know, by a certain age, if you don't have a calving season, how, how do you do that? Are you going to go out and catch cows four or five times throughout a four month window and work the ones that need to be worked and turn the others out that don't, I mean, it, that's, that part gets incredibly difficult for me to wrap my mind around a production model that would work that way. But and I think if I can add on to that, Clint, I think the same is true on the back end. You know, there's something to be said for labor during the calving yeah. season, but during the weaning season, I mean, I'll be real honest, we get our cattle up twice a year, you know, and you're going to get your cattle up and you're going to wean. And let's say you've got a, a spring calving herd, you're weaning in August, September, October, depending on where your window falls. So the reality is, is that you're probably not getting your herd up six times a year. It's too, right. it's too strenuous from a labor perspective. So let's say you wean over Labor Day, the first weekend in September. If you've got calves that calved from January to May, 
your May calves are way behind your January calves because the yeah. reality is you're probably pulling them all off at that point. Uh, or I would, because you're not going to get them back up for another six months. And at that point, they're going to be too old. So I think that the other thing is the labor at time of weaning, your younger calves are way behind your older calves. And it's harder on your cows. It's harder to keep your cows in a productive right. system. And on the flip side of that, and I know this is a little bit out of purvey from a wean calf perspective, but I, you know, I get the hard thing. If you don't calve year round, you've got to have a place to put your bull. You know, if you're only putting your bull in 60 to 90 days, <clears throat> you got to pull him out and put him somewhere. And there's a labor and an equipment side of that too. But I think there's so many options, whether that's you're leasing a bull or you're partnering with a neighbor he's got his bull, you're putting him somewhere else. You know, if you only got one pasture, it's hard to find a place to put your bull. But I just think from, to your point, Clint, you know, a labor perspective um, and really a financial perspective, a calving window is paramount to, to cow calves. Yep. And, and, you know, I, I was, I was told one time that, and this has always stuck with me, uh, kind of an out of the box thinker. He, he managed a, a huge ranch, thousands of head of cattle. And he believed in a long breeding season and a short calving season. And it took me a while to wrap my mind around that when he first said it. But he said, we breed, we may expose animals, AI and natural service for four months. He said, and then at preg check time, we make our sort. And anything that doesn't fit in the window that we want, we sell. We sell, instead of selling as an open, we sell as a bread. And that bread calving in that window may fit somebody else perfectly. It just doesn't fit us. And, and that made a lot of sense to me. You don't, you know, I'm not saying that everybody needs to run out there. It's been calving year round and, and magically pull their bulls on day 65, but you ought to dang sure, at least if you're going to move that way, implement some preg checking status and keep those that are going to calve in a window that's manageable and, and target those other cows for sale. Doesn't mean you got to sell an open cow. Maybe you sell a bread cow that fits your neighbor just perfectly because it calves when he wants it to. Who knows? But, you know, do those there are strategies out there to help implement that. But labor is the biggest thing on that point. And herd health, for me, herd health too. And one other thing I'll add, Clint, if I can. I think to, to wrap up this calving season question, the other thing that you've got to think about is your cow's nutritional plane. If you've got cows at different, if you think about your cow, if you've got her at a different stage of gestation or lactation, it's hard to separate your cows and say, well, I've got this cow who's got a six month old calf on her versus I've got this cow who's got a four month old fetus in her. Those cows are not and should not be on the same nutritional plane. So you're sinking more money into nutrition than you really should have to versus if your cows are all at the same point of a nutritional expectation. But, you know, if you have a can, can defined weaning season or calving right. season. Right. So, okay. One more question. And this is a, a question directly targeted to you, Clint. Um, <laughs> should I weed my calf before I take him to the sale barn? What a great Ooh, question. And how that long? That's a great question. Great question. Okay. Okay, so let's let's attack that and because I've got two answers for that. N number one, how long? Okay, um, it does you no good, no good whatsoever to wean a calf for 12 days, 18 days. We got the ball out of them, let's take them to cell barn. And the reason why is because the, the microbes in their stomach have not transitioned over to being able to handle a diet that, they're still highly acceptable to an influence on an outside stress factors. Okay. They're not nutritionally ready yet. The second part is in general, depending on how you, you did your vaccinations, you've probably not got those animals preconditioned from a vaccine standpoint, building immunology for them to leave any less than 45 days. And then the, the bigger part that I would tell you would be selfish about it. When you're weaning calves, and let's just use the 45-day minimum that we that we've got, we we do we identify 45, we identify 60. Feeder cattle are typically a lot longer than that, but if the first 30 days on a calf in general are the hardest, he's going to back up the first 15, 20 days. He's going to back up in weight in general. Okay, I'm talking wean them in a dry lot scenario kind of deal. Totally take mama away and harsh harsh weaning conditions 
So I want to get all my weight back. I can. I want to get, as the seller, I want to get my compensatory weight back. And that's usually going to take you about 45 days. If you're losing weight for 20, you're regaining it back. Now, other producers are better at this. So there, here's the part two of that question. The first answer, in my opinion, is I would, if I'm going to wean a calf for a day, I'm going to wean a calf for 45 or more. That's my opinion. And personally, because of what I just said about weight gain, I'm going to do 60. I've already done all the work. The last 15 days, I'm probably going to gain more than I did in the last 30 because of he's, he's done. The hard work's over. I'm getting my weight back. I want my weight. That's, that's how I get paid. I want my weight. The other part of it, though, about should I wean my calves, that's where it gets individual. If you can't wean a calf and gain weight, you know, if, if 45 or 60 days from now that calf weighs within 10 pounds of what he did the day you weaned him, you're not very good at weaning calves. So you should not wean calves because that's not cost effective. Now, if you can put a pound to two pounds or two and a half pounds, and I'm, I'm trying not to get ridiculous, like with TMR rations and everything. And, you know, but if you can kick them out on a grass patch, and supplement them a little bit, let them gain a little and let them grow. That's tremendous because, you know, our data shows a wean calf is basically going to bring 850, 100 weight more than a balling calf all of the things equal. I'm not saying it's that way everywhere, but 2 million head of data over two years time, that's what our data showed. So, I mean, it, even if it's just five bucks, a hundred weight and you're putting more weight on, remember, and you're putting more weight on, that's a good thing. So I'm a big believer in weaning calves, especially in the sale barn. Um, yes, there are instances where it's not, but a lot of that's going to come down to how good are you at weaning calves? You know, can, can you incorporate fence line weaning? low stress handling can you have a nutritious forage base for them to go to i mean if you're sticking them in a dry lot with a bale of hay and they've never had hay in their life that's a big transition if you're kicking them if you're pulling them in and all the processing's done you've already preconditioned them and and you're pulling them in and pulling them off mama and you're kicking mom kicking them back out in the pasture they came from and mama across the fence and three days later the the fence line weaning's over and the most of the balls out and them calves have started grazing and growing and you know you're switching their diet over maybe giving them a little supplementation that's a great way to do it. it it's money in your pocket not only for the premium but for the weight gain so it's different for every producer just know your strengths and weaknesses yeah and talk a little bit about supplementation at the time of weaning i mean those it, 30 to 60 days from when you wean them to when you take them what's that supplementation look like on twofold a if they've been you know, if they've had a creep feeder and they've been adjusted to this versus if they have it. Yeah, that's that's a good point. If if you're planning on feeding them a concentrate ration, it'd be great if you could. It, you're just lessening the stress if you expose it to them before, um, whether that's in a creep feed scenario or an open feed where the cows have access to. But they've had a You know, a lot of times, like in our country, we, we talk a lot about cake and grass, um, you know, and calves that are weaned on grass and cake because they came off cows that were used to getting grass and cake typically transition over a lot easier than that. Then if you put them in a dry lot, you start feeding them with a, a, a feed truck or a TMR wagon, you know, um, I'll, I'll tell you one little thing that's really helpful. Um, and I used to start cattle. I worked for, a, a I guess you'd call it a, uh, a high risk outfit where we rode pens and started calves, you know, purchase out of the cell, everything you can, and it's brother, everything under the sun. Lick tubs. Lick tubs are a wonderful additive because you can start those calves and have them exposed alongside their mother in the pasture with a lick tub and they get used to going to it. And then, you know, a lot of times we would have these cattle come in and before they'd ever go to the feed bunk, they'd be wandering around the fences and, you know, hit those lick tubs a couple of times. It stimulates their thirst. They find the water trough, they get hydrated. And once they get hydrated then they get hungry. And then they start, it, it, it's just a great transition. I think lick tubs are a wonderful additive uh, and, and honestly a, a low input, low cost. I mean, I'm going to say low cost, but thanks are low input and you can expose them to them along their, alongside the cow before you ever start the weaning process. And then it's something that's familiar that they can go to, even if all it does is help hydrate them. Cause I, uh, the number one thing you hear guys talk about wanting to get calves on feed and they're right, but you got to get them drinking. That's, that's what hurts them the most off the get-go is that they get dehydrated. And then that, just like on a human, 
dehydration causes other issues with with other health healthy problems so if if you can get them drinking you can get them eating and that's that's a good additive right there is, is a lick tub in my opinion yeah well great presentation clint uh such great information um and i think really answered a lot of questions whether you got five cows or 500 cows uh, great resources here. As a reminder, if you've registered for this webinar, you will get a recorded link sent to you 24 hours from now, so you can go back and watch it uh, and all of our other educational opportunities on our YouTube channel. Um, if you would like the slides or have any further questions for Clint or Texas and Southwestern Cattle Raisers yeah. Association, please email us. Uh, you can email education at tscra.org and we'll be happy to connect you with Clint um, or maybe somebody else um, who can answer your questions if it's not superior related uh, or certainly Clint is just a wealth of knowledge uh, but we thank you so much for your time today appreciate uh, all of your insight and uh, hope you have a great afternoon and safe travels back to Texas all right thank you all thank you for being here and I'm sorry for the technology issues that uh, happenstance sometimes you just got to make the best that you can so I apologize for that that's right that's how it goes thanks for your time all right thank you bye